Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Awesome, awesome. Happy New Year again, and welcome to Annapolis. I want to welcome you on behalf of the District 22 team um, to the 13th annual District 22 Martin Luther King Jr. Dinner, uh, where we meet to honor Dr. King's legacy, passion, selflessness, and dream. Dr. King was born on January 15, 1921, and was taken from this world on April 4, 1968. On this day today, Dr. King, if he was not assassinated, would have been 88 years old today. Uh, please give a round of applause for Dr. King and his legacy. For those of you who, who do not know me, uh, my name is Alonzo Washington. I am your state delegate. Um, if you don't know me, I'm the guy that paid for the food back there. Uh, one of the guys. And uh, we also have, um, we are also, speaking of food, uh, let's give it up for Three Brothers uh, piece of background. Thank you, thank you. Um, you know, at this time, I usually start off by, uh, by asking for a moment of silence for those we've lost in our district. Um, but many of you, last year was a very tough year for many of us. Uh, whether you, it was hard for you to pay your bills, I'm on time while your utility bill was just nagging you, or mortgage bills was getting on your nerves, or even one day when you woke up one day this last year and your president was no longer black. Um, I think today, uh, we all need just a little bit of a prayer for us. So today, I will ask um, if you will indulge me a little bit while I read uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, prayer um, before we all bow our heads. Oh God, we call you different names. Some call you Allah, some call you Elohim, some call you Jehovah, some even call you the unmoved mover. But we know that these are all the names for one and the same God. Oh God, we thank you for the lives of great saints and prophets in the past who have revealed to us that we can stand up amid the problems and difficulties and trials of life and not give in. We thank you for our foreparents who've given us something in the midst of darkness, of exploitation and oppression to just keep going. And we ask you, God, in these days of emotional tension, when the problems of the world are gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail, to be with us in, in our own, on our going out and our coming in, in our rising up and in our lying down, in our moments of joy and in our moments of sorrow, until the day when there shall be no sunset and no dawn. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So moving forward, we have a couple of officials we want to just recognize for you real quick. And what we do, what we do generally during this time is we give them everybody a clap. Can we, everybody just do it? If I say, uh, Senator Paul Pinty is here today. Can we give him a clap? All right, he's still, he's still messing up. No, 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 no. What, what we're going to do, Senator Paul Pinty deserves that. However, uh, we're going we're gonna to do one clap. So when I say uh, Senator Paul Pinsky is here, you're going to say clap. There we go. Senator Paul Pinsky is here. There we go. Okay, we have. <laughs> oh, you got him now. All right. So we also have a. Uh, today we have um, we have Emmett Jordan, Mayor Greenbelt, with us today. We have um, former con former council member Conrad Hurley from Greenbelt. Uh, we have Lincoln Lashley from council member from the city of New Carrollton. We have the mayor Island Thompson from this from the town of Riverdale Park here with us. Um, we do have um, uh, the newest council member and the youngest council member from the Greenbelt City Council, uh, Mr. Colin Burr, with us here today. Uh, we have Ms. Luby Grady from the school board here with us today. We do have um, two very special people, and I'm going to allow you guys to do a little bit more clapping because they're both from our district and they're both vice chair and chair of the Prince George's, of the Prince George's uh, County Council. We have Todd Turner, who's the vice chair here with us today. We have, uh, and we have the chair of the council, the newest chair of the council, uh, Danielle Glowers, who is here with us. Please give her a round of applause, please. Absolutely, well deserved, well deserved. So thank you, everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, make sure, is there anything else we'll hear? Paul, Paul's keeping me in line. I want to make sure I didn't get anything wrong on here. Okay, as many as you know, um, I, have a, I have a very long speech here that I outlined um, that I'm not going to read, um, just simply because 
as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> so I heard that one clap back there. Todd, was that you? See, I try to give you more than one clap. See what happens then? <laughs> uh, we do have uh, Teresa Dudley here with us uh, from the PGCEA uh, here with us. Please give her a clap too. Thank you. All right, uh, we have a. Uh, we have our former chair, uh, Delegate Jolene Ivey, who just walked through the door. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and as many of you know, last year was a very tough year uh, for many of us. Uh, but um, honestly, for me in particular, it started off really well where I was, a, I was appointed chair of the election law subcommittee where I got to vote on, but I got to stand on the floor of the House um, to work on a bill that would, that would make sure that we would have to expand the right to vote for people who want to register to vote on the same day. Um, and I was able to do things like that and work on several other bills. I was actually, a point, I was actually also, um, after the, I passed nine different pieces of legislation last year, which is the which is a highest record for me, actually, nine pieces of legislation. Uh, thank you. Um, in just one session. And you know, even after that session, you know, I was awarded about four different from four different organizations Legislator of the Year awards, um, which uh, it turned out really great for me. But you know, it wasn't until July when I unfortunately lost my uncle to a to a um, violent shooting in D.C. And then later on, to a month and a half later, I honestly lost my mom um, in September, um, and it's been very difficult for me. Um, you know, when, my, when I came here five years ago, I was appointed, and, um, and when I was appointed, my mom, you know, she was the one that held the Bible uh, for me when I was um, actually sworn in. And um, the proudness that you see on her face uh, in that picture that we had together just speaks volumes to, you know, the hard work that, you know, she's put into me with only an eighth grade education and raising six kids on her own. You know, I'm in, in, I am, you know, just been very difficult for me to get out the house and go places and do things, um, but it's been, but it's been because of her, and because of Dr. Martin Luther King that I'm able to stand here t before you today and do some of the things that I'm doing. So, and it was, it was also so many of you um, here that opened your doors to me, um, not only during that trying time, but even before then that welcomed me into your home and sat down with me, that sent me food during those times, or even just became my family. And many of you in this room has always called, called yourselves my mom or my second mom. Uh, so I'm really appreciative of you welcoming me into your family. Um, so thank you for that. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be able to work on issues like closing the achievement gap, which we did this last session of looking at how do we close that achievement gap that persists in our community, the economic equality gap that persists that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Jr. talked about all the time. Now, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be able to stand here and tell you that today that we're now offering free tuition for community college at Prince George's County Community School. And these are things that Dr. Martin Luther King talked about, is closing that achievement gap, removing the school to prison pipeline, to make sure that our kids are educated and economically valuable, you know, in this, in this economy that we're growing. And those are just some of the little things that I've done that I know that so many people like in this room who walked and talked with Dr. Martin Luther King uh, in the past and done those things and worked hard to get me to where I am, I am forever appreciative. Uh, so with that said, we have a lot of work to do this next legislative session. And I know that, you know, we can come up here and we can beat up Trump every single time. We can talk bad things about him and all the negative things that he's brought and divided our country. But Dr. Martin Luther King said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only light can do that. Only love can do that. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Those are the things that Dr. Martin Luther King talked about, of how we can actually not only resist but proactively work against those things that this guy has bringing to us. And that's what we're doing in the General Assembly to ensure that we not only resist, but we work against constantly against those things. And you know, we have we, we've had practice actually with um, with Governor Hogan. You know, we've had practice of resisting and working against those things. He's cut $20 million from our school system when he first came on board and continue to cut that money from our Prince George's County public school system. And now gloating that he's putting money on, um, he's putting more money into our school system more than ever. That's because of people, that's because of the General Assembly and, and we have made him do that. Not because of him, that's because of us. We've worked to make sure that happened. 
You know, when, when we tried to expand voting rights for ex-felons, he vetoed that bill. You know, we came back, he, we came back and we, we undid his veto. Yeah. You know, we made sure that there was ex-felons able to vote in our next election coming up and make sure we open equal access. Even last week, we, 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 we resisted him again and practically worked against him when he, when he, when he vetoed a bill to ban the box so that ex-felons can actually graduate, can actually get into college. You know, he vetoed that. And then we went to and overrode that veto last week so we can expand those rights. Now, this is about opening access and opportunity for our young people. And that's what we've done. And as many of you know, elections have consequences. We've seen that this last time. We've seen it in, with Governor Hogan being elected. We've seen it with this, with this president being open. I hope that we can now open our eyes and see that we can no longer sit at home and wait for people to vote for us, that we have to get up and vote and get your neighbor to vote and get them back, get our Democrats back into office. We need to do that. And so with that said, I want to just thank you for your, for your, for your patience, for your kindness, for your guidance. And on this day of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I hope that we all know that we can work hard together and solve the issues together and not only resist, but proactively get out there to make sure things yeah. don't things change in the right way. So thank you very much for your time and I wish you thank you. So now I have the honor and privilege to introduce um, Delegate Ann Healy, everybody. Please give it for Delegate Healy. Thank you. I'm going to stand in front of them because it's a little easier for you to see me a little. Uh, I don't have the Barbara Mikulski uh, stand that you can stand on. So, um, everybody, it's so great to see everybody here tonight. This is, I just love this evening. Uh, this is not about us, this is about you. You are really and truly the beloved community. You are. You look around this room, and I'm so proud to represent District 22 and all the people here. I have the distinct honor to introduce our speaker for tonight. And I, um, you know, Alonzo talked about how the governor failed to fully fund our schools. The funding formula that we've been using that was written to fund the schools so that they would be not only adequate, but on the path to excellence, the bridge to excellence law that we passed, was a result of the hard work and leadership of this gentleman that I'm going to introduce to you, Dr. Alvin Thornton. Dr. Thornton is a remarkable person in our community. He is a leader in civil rights always. Always, from the, I, I first met him many years ago when I was the editor of the Prince George's Post Sentinel back in the mid 80s. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was a professor at Howard University and we had uh, great conversations. But uh, the conversation I remember most was after we passed the Thornton Law, the Bridge to Excellence. Because it was such a landmark piece of legislation. It funds education for all children, regardless, and extra money for those who have extra needs, the children growing up in concentrated poverty, the children who come from homes where no one speaks English and where their parents may not be able to be even literate in their own language, and for children who have special needs. And all of that, added together was really the best thing that could have happened for Prince George's County. Unfortunately, it was never really fully funded except for maybe one year in all the years since we passed it. There was one way or another, people got out of it. There was depressions and recessions and nothing was totally fully funded. But the vision of a fully funded education system is because of Dr. Thornton and the leadership he provided in the Thornton Commission years ago. Now we have another commission ongoing, and you know who's on it? Alonzo Washington. <laughs> Paul Pinsky.
District 22 is full of strong leaders, and I'm the ones sitting out here in their own communities, so many of you there, city council, community organizations. This is what it means to be part of a community, and I'm so proud to be part of you, and I would like to tell you a little, one more thing about what Dr. Thornton has done. The Thornton Commission has infused over 1.3 billion, that's with a B, dollars in Maryland schools based on that formula on adequacy and equity, not just, you know, spreading the poverty around, but actually adding more into the pot so that there is an opportunity for our children. A longtime professor of political science at Howard University who rose to be in the office of the provost and is still currently a resident of Prince George's County. We're proud to have Dr. Thornton. Please come up. Greetings, everyone, and um, my dear sister, thank you for those uh, kind uh, comments about me. Uh, I do have very, very deep and fond memories of the, the work that we've done over the past uh, almost quarter of a century now. Um, and um, I want to thank you for the contributions that, that you have made uh, to the people of Prince George's County as a representative. <coughs> I, I, I particularly want to thank uh, Senator Pinsky, who I've also known for almost a quarter of a century. Uh, I knew him when he was not a senator. And uh, we were in the, uh, the belly, uh, some people call it the beast in those days, uh, fighting you know, to bring a, a different identity and concept to our community, uh, to create the, the possibilities that I see now present in this room. So my heart is filled with great joy as I see the, uh, what I call the mosaic diversity, the pluralism that is in this room, which was always, not always the case. Uh, and so Paul, uh, to your leadership and the leadership of your delegate colleagues and those of us, we created what I now see before me. And we never want to take uh, that for granted, and we always want to celebrate uh, those who sacrificed uh, career and family in order to create uh, what I call a very majestic diversity. Some people take it for granted, obviously, right? And they want to take us back um, to a kind of, kind of nativism, uh, you know, kind of separateness, artificial separateness that divides us against each other and will not let that happen as we did not let it happen in the past. So I, with that comment, I really could sit down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the way here, I'm, I'm uh, on the way here, I stopped by and, and said hello to Thurgood, who's standing up over there. <laughs> Well, every time I come to Annapolis, I always stop by to say hello to Thurgood. And, uh, and we talk. Some people call me crazy, but I'm not crazy. <laughs> and we talk, and Thurgood says, you know, don't give up on Martin's and my dream. We talk, and he looks down on me, and he says, don't give up on our dream. It was difficult for me when I went, and this is Thurgood talking now. Son of Maryland, a great son of Maryland. This is difficult for me when I went to talk to Strom Thurmond in South Carolina and ask him to do what? To give life to the concept of citizenship in our Constitution. And Thurmond said, Thurgood, uh, I can't do that because I can't get the votes for it. Thurgood says, This has nothing to do with votes, this has to do with humanity and fundamental rights that people have as a birthright, that we have committed ourselves to giving to people, notwithstanding the difficulty of doing so. This is in the 1950s, and Thurgood is speaking <coughs> to Senator Thurman. We need that voice now to speak to the person who some call our president. We need that voice to speak uh, to him at this moment. I'm a son of Alabama, 
So I bring a particular experiential background to this discourse. I'm a 70-year-old black man from Alabama. So I bring a particular experiential background to this day in this discussion. Right? I'm a 45-year husband of my darling Annette and a grandfather of four beautiful children. Senator Pinsky and delegates and colleagues, I'm a taxpayer. I've worked hard, right? You see what I'm saying? I'm the dream. I am the dream, having come true. You see, I'm the greatest creation that our country has ever created. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You know, my mother and father were sharecroppers in George Wallace's Alabama. You had 10 children living as sharecroppers picking cotton. No one ever thought I would be the Thornton Commission. No one ever thought I would be a university professor. No one ever thought I would have a successful marriage of 45 years and grandkids and, and be civically engaged. No one ever thought that. But see, the great mentors of Martin Luther King, Benjamin Mays, yeah? Uh -huh. You know, Robert Brisbane. Mm -hmm. uh, they went to get King uh -huh. at the age of 15 and brought him to Morehouse mm -hmm. after he graduated from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what's the name of the high school there in Atlanta? Uh, I'll think of it in a minute, senior moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they went and got him and brought him there. Now Benjamin Mays went to Alabama and got me. Benjamin Mays was Martin's mentor. He was his teacher. Benjamin Mays was my mentor and my teacher, although we're separated by many decades, right? That was one thing that was in common that he held in common about Mays and me. He knew that what? We were not an extension of a test score. We were not an extension of an SAT. I probably made 600 on the SAT, but I'm a, I was a provost. <laughs> I'm a public scholar. You understand what I'm saying? And Benjamin Mays came to get me, and he said, son, he got me from George Wallace with the racism and negativism dripping from his mouth, wanting to hold me back, and Mays came to get me as he had come to get King. Yeah. And I sat in the seats that, made, that, that Martin King sat in at Morehouse. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I sat in the dorm, Graves Hall, that King sat in. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm a Morehouse man like he is. Mm -hmm. And I believe that as an extension of that, we had an obligation. So there is no wonder when I came into Prince George's County, my duty was, to, in 1971, my duty was to serve. It was automatic. Yeah. Right? It was automatic. My duty was to serve. Oh, yeah. my, I, I could have taken my tenured professorship. No one can fire me. I'm a tenured professor. I can say what I want to say. I can write what I want to write in the Prince George's Journal. <laughs> I can speak on behalf of what? The pluralism and inclusion and opportunity that our people need. All of our people. I could do that. But I did that because what? I grew up in the environment of Martin Luther King and Benjamin Mays. I was sitting there in 1968. I was a sophomore at Morehouse. It was a rainy evening on April the 4th. I was sitting in a little movie theater. Someone came in and said, Dr. King has been shot. I'm at Morehouse. Yeah? And I remember the boys we all, Morehouse is an all-male school in Morehouse and in Atlanta. We all walked out dazed. We walked to the president's home, Hugh Gloucester, on campus, and we just surrounded his house, and he walked out. It was raining. We couldn't do anything but cry. You know, our prince had been killed. He'd been killed by the hate that he decried. Huh? 
So I'm sitting there several days later and we're all marching in the funeral procession. It was required that all Morehouse men had to walk side beside his casket being drawn by that old wagon, remember? You see in the pictures, right? They're driven and pulled by mules. The same mules that as a sharecropper's son, I used to get to the cotton fields. That, that's the majestic, that's why it was a mule and a wagon. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And we're holding hands all the way from Ebenezer to the campus of the Atlanta University Center in Morehouse, where Benjamin Mays, his mentor, his father, spiritual intellectual father, preached his funeral. Mm -hmm. It was so difficult for a little boy from George Wallace's Alabama to have his king taken from him at the age of 39 at the age of 39. Today, um, he would be 89 years old. See, taken from him at that age. So when we talk about, I'm no son of a shit house. If there's some young children in here, I apologize. I'm not a son of a shit house or ass house or anything else. You understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah. And I will be very, very angry about that because of what I'm describing to you. I and what we did to produce me is the best hope for our nation. Yeah. In producing me, we did what no other nation has been able to do for its citizens. Mm. No other nation has tried to do what we did as Americans, to constitutionalize citizenship and rights and disperse it among all of its people, notwithstanding race, gender, national origins, or anything else. No other nation has done that like we have done that. And that's what makes us great. So anybody who comes along because of an artificial electoral consequence, and interrupts that grand design that I just described to you and moves us as a nation off course from the greatest thing that's been done by humanity needs to be dealt with. Immediately. It has to be dealt with because this, as I said, the greatest thing that's been done by any nation state is what I'm talk describing to you. So, see, I'm, I'm it, it, raise your hand, uh, Senator Pinsky, when I get to my seven or eight minutes. That you <laughs> he told me, he knows me, he knows I talk. He said, seven minutes, brother. <laughs> so when, you know, I, I told Attorney General Sessions, <laughs> see, we, we are contemporaries. He and I are the same age. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. He's right there in Shelby County, Alabama. I'm in Randolph County. He's 70, I'm 70. Come he might on. be 71. Come on now. Right now, which vision of the world will it be? His or mine? Uh, right. I say mine is superior to his. That's right. yeah. Just like Fergus was superior to Roger Tunney. Uh -huh. You all know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. But that is the great struggle that we have embarked on as a nation. Now, we must make sure that when we talk about Martin Luther King, we talk about it in this way. It is a struggle about our nation, our, our identity. What will our constitution mean? What will citizenship mean? Can a person describe a whole people without knowing whether they believe in our country, whether they are educated, whether they are whatever, as being what? unilaterally different from and less than other people and hold the office of president. Can a person do that? In 2018. Now I say, I get in trouble when I say this. You know, Paul told me I could talk a little bit. Even if I could, I wouldn't go to a State of the Union address. The Congress of the United States, what if Barack Obama had said 
all people from Europe come, come from all countries. Come on now. He said, I'm a son of Africa. He said, all 54 countries countries. I am a son of Africa. I'm a son of Jacob and Caroline who were brought to this country in 1805 and who helped to build this nation's great wealth. And you're going to call me shit home? And I'm paying your salary? See, this is serious. I will not let you sleep one moment until you know that that is unacceptable yeah. in the presidency of this country. Yeah. This is what Martin would want. This is what Martin would want us to say. So the question is, whose vision of America will our children inherit? I look out here at my babies. They shouldn't have to, my babies who are the young ones. You shouldn't have to go through this crap. We've, we've answered those questions. We answer those questions. My generation, you shouldn't have to go through that. The constitutional design, we have said that our 14th Amendment citizenship concept, the privileges and immunities and the due process will extend to you, as Martin said, as a function of your character and not as a function of your color, of your gender, of your orientation or anything else. And I have to open these questions again in 2018? No. I will not do that. And as uh, Doug Washington said, you know, I can talk all I want. The only way I'm going to do that is to vote. Yep. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I have to vote, right? Yeah. Uh, now, Martin Luther King, I'm presumptuous enough to say that in, if he were here now, uh, that he would say he would be focused on the following. Same things that he was focused on when he was killed. He was talking about working people, the dignity of work, the dignity of working people, livable wage for people, right? So that people can have homes, livable wage for people, so people can have homes, they can take care of their children and their families and their needs. Health care yeah. as a birthright. Yeah. Health care as a birthright. See, Thurgood and, and Martin, they said, see, as a child, uh, uh, Senator Pinsky, I could not go across the street and go in the front of a restaurant. As a 13-year-old child, my life was threatened at gunpoint for simply going across the street to eat a hamburger, which means that what? That my citizenship was a function of my race. Now, that's in 1964. Now, I'm saying to you that what we have said is that citizenship in 2018 will be something totally different. As an extension of my citizenship, I should have what? Health care. I should have health care as an extension of my citizenship. I should have, this is what I'm most proud of, I should have equitable, adequate education. Yeah not as a function of the zip code in which I live. Yeah. Come on now. Not as a function of the county in which I live, but as a function of the fact that I'm a citizen of Maryland, yeah. not of Montgomery County, Prince George's, Hartford, whatever, I'm a citizen of Maryland, and citizenship should do what? Give me access to that. Yeah. Yeah? I could go right down the list from, of all these things we're talking about. We're talking about, and then I'm going to sit down because I'm being told. Uh, we're talking about doing what Thurgood said to Thurman, Strong Thurman. We will update citizenship to provide increasingly universal rights to the people of this country. That's exactly what it's all about. So, so I'm saying uh, that the Martin Luther King that we celebrate today is very needed because unfortunately, the old questions that I thought were answered yeah. are being opened again. Yeah. Yeah. So we need Martin more than ever. Oh, yeah. We need his voice. Yeah. We need his vision. Yeah. We need his willingness to sacrifice 
we need his willingness to go from privilege and go to the people as he did, right? Mm -hmm. And I think if we will not artificially inflate him into a celebratory holiday, but go back and look at really what Martin Luther King was, uh, uh, then we'll be doing justice to Martin Luther King. Thank you all for inviting me this morning. represent this district for that reason. I have five grandchildren. I started off with zero when I came to the legislature. I have five. <laughs> Two children. And three of my grandchildren are biracial. And they ask me the question, Gigi, that's what they call me. <laughs> what are we talking about? Why do I have to, why do I have to leave? No, you say. Uh, am I white or am I black? Well, do a little bit of both. I have two grandchildren in the Spanish Immersion Program in Prince George's County. They come home telling me they want to send my friends away. What can you do, Gigi? Because Gigi can fix everything. In it. <laughs> what can you do? You're a delegate. What can you do? All of us. All of us have to make sure that our children understand, our grandchildren understand the diversity that we have. And that we're all the same. We all have equal rights. We can do the things that we need to do and we want to do. And we can change the world. At least we can do our best in starting to change Prince George's County. I remember when I moved into the home that I'm still living in. Probably a year after they allowed blacks to move into that town. I became the mayor of that town. And you can be the mayor. By not running for mayor, but the person with the most votes. And what that is, is the person who did the most in the eyes of the people who live there got to be the man. And a lot of this started many, many years ago, but still right. And I was a young girl, I didn't do a lot. And I was asked to serve in the House of Delegates by our current Senator Paul Pensky. And I think Paul kind of looked around, because he could have picked any of the 120 people in the cabinet who were eligible to run or be appointed, but he selected me. And he wanted a diverse district. He fought for civil rights long before I knew who he was. And he's still doing it. Still doing it. Look at him. Does he have to? He's very tall. <laughs> <laughs> but he does it because he believes in it. Every day. I can't tell you the number of times he's been arrested for this. Yeah. I'm a chicken. I stay home. I write a letter. I call. He goes out and marks. He'll do it for all of us. He wants this diversity in our district like we have. As I, and as I started off, no other district looks like this. None. I'm very proud to be a part of the 22nd Legislative District, and I'm very, very proud 
to have Senator Paul Pinsky as my senator. Right. He only gives us a couple of minutes to say, <laughs> and we try really, really hard to stick to that because there's something else we have to do at 8 o'clock. So Paul, Thank you, Tuan, and thank all of you for coming this evening um, and celebrating Dr. King's life and legacy with us and celebrating the work of the 22nd District. Um, Alvin was being kind uh, by saying we've known each other 25 years. I, I think it extends into 30 or 30 plus um, because actually it was Jesse Jackson who brought us together around the Rainbow Coalition trying to build a rainbow coalition of black, white, brown, and Asian, and, and gay, and straight, and a lot of other people, uh, from rural Alabama to um, suburban New Jersey, um, joining up in, in Forestville, or I'm not sure where it was, at a church, I remember, when uh, in, in the mid-'80s working for uh, Jesse Jackson's campaign. So, uh, Alvin, I want to thank you for all your work. It wasn't it great? Before I share a few thoughts with you, I, you know, a number of people went into making this work. Uh, our staffs, uh, interns, uh, Ian Ullman in my office, Carol Smith, uh, a lot of people went into making this happen. Um, I also want to um, share and mention uh, my friend, my partner, my wife, Joan Rothgib, who's here and giving me support. You know, it's, it's almost 50 years uh, since Dr. King lost his life in the struggle for, for uh, social and economic justice. Uh, three months short of 50 years, April 4th. So we're, we're almost at 50 years. Tonight, I'd like to sh just share a few ideas and thoughts about those two issues, uh, racism and inequality, and then also talk about resilience. I want to talk about resilience tonight. Um, we know Dr. King's history and legacy. He, he worked for the Civil Rights Act. He forced President Johnson and other people to move when they sometimes didn't want to move uh, in terms of employment discrimination, discrimination in public uh, places, uh, and also the Voting Rights Act on 60, uh, 1964 and 1965. Um, but as his work continued, um, he vocalized the need to attack other barriers as well. In 1968, about two weeks before he was assassinated, uh, he said at a presentation, I think it was when he was with uh, Ask Me Workers, actually, talking about uh, working people. Uh, he said, now our struggle is for genuine equality, which means economic equality. And he went, on, he went on to say, and I thought this was great, and I quote, we know that it isn't enough to integrate lunch counters. What does it to profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't have enough money to buy a hamburger? And I just thought that was so cogent. You know, and if on one hand you look at race and, and discrimination, and on the other hand you look at income inequality and poverty, unfortunately you have a pretty complete match. They overlap each other, almost 100%. Now clearly we can look around this room, we know members of minority communities have risen to the middle class. And that is a testament to his work in the civil rights movement. But it's few and far between where a minority community has moved to the corporate boardrooms and actually control the wealth in this country. Now, since Dr. King's death, um, some things have changed, and unfortunately, some things haven't changed. Um, many barriers still uh, have been broken down, but unfortunately, racism still exists. You know, we've mentioned uh, the president. And just last week, we heard the President of the United States disparage other countries, other cultures, peoples of color, and praise people from Finland, which, Norway. Norway. But the point is, Western European white people, you know. Norway, yes. Haiti and West Africa, no. You know, that's, that's the message. But the comments of this narciss narcissistic 
Know Nothing Neanderthal, who called president, re reflects, yeah, narcissistic, know nothing Neanderthal. That, that's, um, it reflects an, an overt or an obvious aspect of racism. But there are other aspects, like income inequality, a situation that disproportionately um, affects people of color, that still remains. And in fact, it's getting worse. You, the recent tax bill in Congress is a perfect example. It gave multi-millions of dollars to the wealthiest 1% and the large corporations. And the people that spearheaded it, just two months before, talked about cutting the deficit. Yet to pass the tax bill, they increased the deficit. So the insidious aspect of this is in the coming months or coming year, they're going to go back to be calling themselves deficit hawks, and they're going to have to cut the deficit after they increased it. And how are they going to cut the deficit? Cut Medicaid, cut Medicare, cut school funding, cut other safety net programs. The very people that Dr. King struggled for the voiceless, the dispossessed. And it will end up being one of the largest transfer of wealth from working in poor folks to the pockets of the very wealthy. And it actually exacerbates the income inequality that in his last years of his life he was fighting so hard against. But there are other areas. It's not just income inequality. It's the assault on voter rights across many states, particularly in the South, there's been an effort to suppress voting by minorities. It's not enough to have one piece of identification. You have to have two or you have to have three. Now that's going to court. But it doesn't even stop there. In the redistricting in the South, in Texas, in North Carolina, and Florida, they're trying to compress people, minorities particularly, into districts to dilute their power and authority. That's being contested in the court, thank heavens, the federal courts have ruled them unconstitutional, thank, thankfully because of the president who put them in a, as judges in a, in, a, in a place. One more example, and uh, Dr. Thornton talked about health care. And there's been an assault on health care and the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare as we know it. Because of Ob Obamacare, 19 million people who didn't have health insurance had health insurance coverage. 19 million people. That's a lot of people. But in the last year, in an effort to reverse that, to stop people from signing up for health care, people who need it, and to make a point, the Trump administration, what they did in the last three months, they cut the enrollment period by half. They cut advertising to sign up by 90%. And they cut the navigators, the staff who helped, who assisted, by 40%. You would think the numbers of people signing up would plummet. But the number of people who signed up was at 95% of the number that signed up the year before. That is resilience, ladies and gentlemen. That is the fight back, the commitment. Look, many barriers to social justice remain. We know that. They may be different from some of the ones that Dr. King fought. Obviously, he didn't know about Obamacare. He, that, that succeeded him. It came afterwards. The barriers to stop people from signing up for health care. You know, he didn't have that at that point. But just as in the 50s and 60s at, um, at the bridge, at John Lewis, people didn't roll over. They got back up yeah. and kept marching and struggling. Yeah. I think in some small way, the people who said, we don't care what barriers you put up, Mr. President, we're going to sign up for health care. And that resilience is something I think we learned from Dr. King. And again, he won it in a peaceful way. But that struggle, that attitude, it continues. And we have to grow it because we have a lot more changes to go. And that resilience um, 
that Dr. King believed in, I and my colleagues believe that as well. In fact, we're counting on it. We're committed to representing that response, that resilient response, as we continue to fight the struggle for social justice here in Annapolis. Last week, we made sure that all Maryland workers, no matter where they worked, would have earned paid sick leave. 700,000 people, many of them African American and Latino, who had to make a choice between going home and being sick and, or taking care of a loved one mm -hmm. and losing a day's pay. Yeah. I mean, that it took this long is nuts. I mean, think about it, and I use this example, someone who's handling food at a fast food place, you don't want them at work. No. You want them at home. Yeah. 700,000 people did not have one day of sick leave. Mm -hmm. Governor Hogan vetoed it, and last week yeah. the House and the Senate overturned that veto. Yeah. And he said it has <laughs> you know, I and a number of advocates around the state and the legislature want to make sure that health care is a right, not simply a privilege. Health care should be a right and not a privilege. Because we still have people uninsured and some underinsured. And we know how high those premiums are. And you know, if you think about it, and I'm not going to mention people's age, um, but we have a system called Medicare that takes care of every senior in the country. And you know, it's not run by the insurance companies. Profit's not a part of it. And everyone gets decent care. It's not perfect, but they get decent care at an affordable price. And my question is, if we can do it for seniors, why can't we do it for every citizen in this United States? I will be supporting a health care for all bill, whether you call it like Canada or Western Europe or other places. We should have health care for, for every citizen, everybody in this country. You know, um, Delegate Washington talked about education uh, a little while ago. Um, and at, as he has done in Prince George's County um, to advocate having um, an opportunity for young people to pursue an AA degree at a community college or job certification. And the program's gotten off the ground uh, to a large degree because of his work in the county. It is time, it is past time, that across the whole state of Maryland, that community college for either job certification or a community college degree, an AA degree, should be free. People shouldn't leave college with debt. And actually, for people enrolling in four-year institutions, and I see some young people in this room, um, they should be able to graduate without debt that keeps them behind the eight ball for year after year after year. Again, earlier, the Kerwin Commission, which is a successor to the Thornton Commission, which uh, I and Delegate Washington are two of 25 from across the state who, who are serving on, and we spent a year. It had two purposes, <coughs> to come up with a new formulation, a new um, uh, revenue to make sure all school systems are adequate and equitable. But it had a second component. And that was to transform Merlin schools to be world class. Mm -hmm. We have good schools, but it's an uneven school system in our own county. And unfortunately, across the state, there are areas of problems, mostly where there's high concentration of poverty. Mm -hmm. And those areas need more support, more money, and more direction. But even within the United States, we're not number one. And we should be. We have the resources. We have the will. We have to overcome those barriers to make that happen. And when we do it, we should leave no one behind that the poorest communities, whether it be in Prince George's County or Baltimore, or even where there's poverty in areas of Montgomery County or on the Eastern Shore, we have to make sure an extra degree, an extra focus, a laser-like focus, to give the services, not just the education, but the wraparound services of mental health, 
of physical health because you can't learn if you're not healthy. That's right. And that has to be part of any component going forward. So let, let me close, and I, I'm not sure who said it, I think we probably all believe it. It's going to be a challenging year. While sadly some elected leaders here in Maryland will be silent in the face of President Trump's attacks, I can guarantee we will not. We will support every effort to protect Marylanders from Garrett County to Ocean City and absolutely making sure Prince George's County is protected. Whether it's about the tax bill, whether it's about health care, we have a lot of work to make up because they're doing a lot of damage in Washington yes. and we can't let our governor sit on it and turn, and turn backwards on it. We have to go forwards. No, that's right. And, and, and let me close with this. You know, we run for office, we serve at your pleasure, you decide whether we should stay every four years. But I have to tell you, it is actually your determination, it is your support, and if I may say, your resilience your resilience that drives my interest, and I think probably for my colleagues, to serve as a voice and to be serve as your state senator in the struggle to make Maryland better and a just state. Thank you. Last thing, I, I, I am remiss. I, I want to make sure that everybody knows that my wonderful husband of 39 years is here. Stephen Neal Conway, St. Jerome's Church. We usually end our Martin Luther King program with lift every voice. We have the words at every table, and oh, bingo, we have it in front of us as well. And I would happily defer to lead off the scene to someone else who'd like to get started because I'll butcher it. Uh, anybody? Emma. Uh, I'm not much of a singer, but whatever one please rise. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony. Thank you.